joining our panel today. Um, it's 12.30, so it's time to start. But uh, while we wait for others to join, I'm going to play a short video that will give you a background to uh, the what we're talking about on this panel today. So let's get started. We hear a lot about environmental injustices, but have you heard about it in the beauty industry? My name is Dr. Lariah Edwards. I'm a research scientist at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, and I study environmental racism in the beauty industry. Beauty centers that glorify European features such as white or light skin or straight hair are more than just annoying for people of color, particularly women of color. These beauty norms create pressure for women to look a certain way in order to receive real world benefits like success in relationship or at jobs or just fair treatment. And so products like chemical straighteners or skin lighteners are heavily marketed for women of color as the answer. However, these products contain toxic chemicals that can be damaging to women's health. For example, the use of chemical straighteners has been linked to uterine and breast cancers. And mercury, which is often found in skin lighteners, has been linked to neurotoxicity and metabolic problems. In our most recent study, we wanted to characterize use of chemical, chemical straighteners and skin lighteners among individuals in northern Manhattan. We also want to understand how beauty norms impact product use. For this study, we partnered with We Act for Environmental Justice, an organization based in northern Manhattan. In our survey, we asked over 200 individuals, both women and women identified individuals, about the product that they use and their personal reasons for using these products. We also asked questions such as, which hairstyle people generally find more beautiful on women? Which hairstyle makes women look wealthier and younger? We also asked similar questions about skin. In our study, we found that half of all respondents thought that people around them find straight hair and light skin to be more beautiful. That's half of all respondents. We also found the use of skin lighteners was highest in the past year among Asian respondents at 57%. We also found that respondents born outside the U.S. had higher use of skin lighteners than respondents that were born in the U.S. There was some good news with our study, but our study is just that Black women are using less chemical straighteners, which goes in line with the national hair movement. So what do we do? How do we push back against environmental justice in the beauty industry? There are two good ways to fight. Number one, use your voice. Advocate for bills that regulate the chemicals that are found in these products. States like Maryland and California have already passed bills that have banned the most toxic chemicals from personal care and beauty products. And number two, use your dollar. Don't buy products with toxic chemicals listed on the labels. This helps keep you safe and tell companies that you don't support these chemicals in our products. If you want to know how you can shop smarter, see the link below. And also, if you want to learn more about our study, We Expedi Inside Out campaign or Age of Change, you'll find those links below as well. All right. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sophia Huda. I'm your moderator. Uh, I work for We Act for Environmental Justice, obviously, and I'm joined by my colleagues in the Department of Environmental Health, Jaron uh, and uh, Bo. So uh, before I begin, um, I guess you all have kind of figured this out already. Uh, please use the chat function for questions or uh, comments. Uh, my colleagues will be monitoring the chat. We have a Q&A at the end of the panel discussion. And we'll also be asking um, for some feedback, uh, some questions to the uh, audience through the panel. So please use the, the chat function for that. Um, this webinar will be recorded and available online afterwards. So uh, I manage our Beauty Inside Out campaign, and Beauty Inside Out was started in 2019 to shine a light on the disproportionate impact toxic chemicals in personal care and beauty products have on people of color. Um, in the U.S., Black women are the biggest consumers of beauty products, and Latino women are a rapidly growing market. Um, and racialized beauty norms can and do inform some of their purchasing habits, particularly in regard to hair relaxers and skin lightening creams. So as part of the campaign, we did a survey of adult women and femme identifying people of color in Northern Manhattan. We did that in 2020. Um, we also currently are conducting youth surveys um, uh, for uh, people of color um, age 13 to 17 uh, to also understand their purchasing habits of um, these uh, particular products. And as part of the campaign, we're doing product testing and outreach and education activities. So the panel's discussion today, as you saw from that video, um, is centers around the results of our adult surveys, especially the findings on colorism. Um, the survey results were compiled by one of our panelists who are here today, Dr. Lariah Edwards, who was in the video. 
Uh, Dr. Edwards is an associate research scientist in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University's uh, Mailman School of Public Health. She's also an assistant director of the Agents of Change in Environmental Justice Fellowship. Um, Dr. Edwards' research focuses on understanding the health effects of and addressing exposure disparities to hormone altering chemicals commonly found in consumer and personal care products. So as you can tell, I needed my notes for that. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Lariah to give a summary of the report. Um, so let me just get to the one pager. And Lariah, it's all yours. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this panel today to talk about a very, very, very important topic. Um, so the video kind of gave an overview of the our new PIP publication, Environmental Justice, that was a collaboration between regions at Columbia University, as well as We Act, uh, looking at, you know, toxic beauty product use in Northern Manhattan. And Sophia gave a nice overview of you know, the key key study parts and the results. And so focusing particularly on the skin lightener results, because uh, that's kind of, that informs the discussion today of colorism. Um, you know, colorism is something that a lot of us are probably very aware of. And when, you know, you hear some of these results and you hear the headline from this, uh, from this paper that, um, you know, racist beauty standards are driving toxic beauty product use, it is sadly unsurprising just given this, you know, given the world we live in in our society. So some of the key results that kind of point to colorism concerns that beauty was the top reason why respondents reporting using skin lighteners. Um, and that's very, that's very concerning. Uh, respondents reported using a lot of different kinds of skin lighteners, such as creams, um, lotions, pads, there are just a variety of products available out there. Um, and we did see that skin lightener use was high among Asian respondents compared to th those that were identified as non-Asian respondents. And respondents who were born outside the U.S. reported um, higher use of skin lighteners than respondents who were born inside the U.S. And we also wanted to think, you know, and address these, uh, what may be driving actual use and perceptions of colorism and beauty. Um, and respondents reported that they believe that others attribute certain advantages to women with light skin. So for example, looking younger or wealthier or more beautiful. Yet in comparison, respondents didn't personally feel this way. So for example, 50% of respondents thought that others find lighter skin more beautiful on women, while only 33% of respondents personally felt this way. So this idea that respondents recognize that society and others, maybe their peers find light skin to be more beautiful, but they recognize and they don't personally feel that way. But maybe these feelings about, you know, um, maybe these understandings of what others think may be driving their product use. Um, we found that respondents who thought other people believe that light skin makes women look more beautiful or younger were more likely to currently use skin lighteners than women who didn't have these beliefs. And though that's, that's use in the past year. So these results regarding skin lighteners definitely point to an issue and concern about colorism. This idea that using these products led to respondents feeling like they should be seen as more beautiful or they felt more beautiful. And I hope that the results today can kind of inform this discussion about colorism and really get it, really getting us, getting us to think about it and maybe challenge this, challenge these beliefs and maybe reevaluate why we use certain products, why we feel the need to put certain products that have these toxic chemicals on our face. We well, it is well known that skin liners contain mercury, hydroquinone, corticosteroids, and all of these chemicals have been linked to harmful health effects. So, you know, addressing colorism is one step in the right direction of keeping us healthy, both physically from, you know, uh, reducing exposure to toxic chemicals and mentally. And, um, and that's very important. All right. Thanks very much, Lariah. Um, all right. So, now it's the audience turn. I'm gonna ask you uh, in the chat to uh, respond to this question. When you hear the term colorism, what comes to mind? Um, and while you guys are answering that, I'll take the time to introduce our other panelists today. So uh, with us today, we have Annabelle Cole. Um, she's an officer of research community outreach and uh, research translation at the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health. 
Um, Annabelle has worked in the nonprofit sector promoting the health and wellness of her community for over a decade and is focused on our community's knowledge and involvement with environmental justice and environmental health issues. As a first generation Latina, she self identified as Black and Latina before Afro Latina was a widely used term. In contrast to the message she received from her family and community on how to present herself as Dominican. Annabelle holds a uh, Master in Science in Nonprofit Management from the New School and a Master of Public Health from Columbia University. Also today with us, we have TK Sacco. Sorry about that. Uh, so also with us today, we have Brianna Black, who is the executive director of the Leave It Better Foundation, whose mission is to fill the void in environmental education in our school system. But Brianna is also a makeup artist. Her work has been featured in Vogue on the New York uh, Fashion Week runways, and she also does special effects makeup for uh, movies and music videos. And last but not least, we have Alev. Um, Alev is a friend of mine. He hails from Milwaukee. Um, I've known Alev when I first met Alev. He used to work uh, in Sephora. And today, he hangs out with the stars. His work has been featured in Vogue, Numero, L'Officiale magazine, on the red carpet of the Met Gala, and on the runway for New York Fashion Week also. So um, let us see what all of you thought. Uh, what comes to mind with colorism? I don't, where's the chat? Um, all right, I guess we didn't get any responses. <laughs> Maybe- it's uh, in the Q&A, Sophia. Oh, it's in the Q&A, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have. Uh, colorism is racism. Um, okay. Well, I can tell you what I think of when media and beauty. Yeah. When I think of colorism, I think of uh, the SPF 70 sunscreen that a friend of mine of Sri Lankan heritage left uh, when she came to visit me in New York. And if you're not familiar, people from um, Sri Lanka and South India, I'm uh, South Asian heritage myself, tend to have darker skin. And of course, colorism in uh, the South Asian community is a, a big problem. Um, we're constantly told do not get dark in the sun, do not darken your skin more. And hence why people feel the need to buy SPF 70 uh, sunscreen um, to protect themselves, not from UV rays, not from you know uh, some damage to their skin um, or anything like that, but to protect themselves from getting darker skin. Um, and of course, uh, you know, this was uh, pervasive in, in my family too. My mom is uh, uh, darker skinned in our family and um, has uh, many memories of being teased for that by her own family members, her, her own mother. And, um, you know, uh, was always told us stay out of the sun, um, not because it's going to give you wrinkles, but because you'll be dark and that's a bad thing. Um, so now I turn to the panelists um, and uh, how would you guys define um, colorism? Uh, well, TK, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so how I define colorism is the prejudice and discrimination against darker skinned individuals um, within the same racialized group and the simultaneous like idealization of lighter skinned individuals. And I would, I love to make it a point that colorism informs more than our some of our romantic preferences. It also has the ability to produce unfavorable health outcomes employment outcomes and just generally life outcomes um, for darker skinned individuals. And I'm really thrilled that there um, is more research these days about how colorism intersects other um, fields of oppression, such as like police brutality and people are paying attention to like who, like what types of darker, darker skinned um, black people are being brutalized by the police. Um, um, there is a researcher, uh, uh, professor of sociology at Harvard, his name is Dr. Elis Pimonk, who does a lot of research about 
um, colorism and how it affects um, health um, within um, Black communities and who is more likely to have high blood pressure and like is more likely to be more stressed. And um, even with um, COVID recently and um, artificial intelligence and medical devices like pulse exometers and them not being able to read, um, pick up, do accurate readings um, for people with darker skin. And so colorism is a lot more than um, who is dating who and you know um, who do we see on the screen. Those things are super, super important. But um, I'm glad that I get to be in spaces like this where we can move the conversations forward and beyond that. Yeah, you, you brought up a good point with the uh, medical equipment. A lot of people don't realize that um, so many things are calibrated towards uh, different, uh, towards white skin tones, fair skin tones. Um, I knew this was the case, say, with film and uh, with uh, anything around film, old school film, but also new uh, digital cameras and things like that. They're calibrated towards lighter skin to make, you know, uh, to make sure those are exposed. But I recently learned even um, automatic hand dryers or, uh, you know, for the sinks, the automatic sinks are calibrated towards uh, lighter skin. Uh, and that, you know, sometimes when we go and it's like, why isn't this working? It's because it can't pick up our skin color, oddly enough. Um, does any, uh, Annabelle, what, what, how would you um, define colorism or what does that term mean to you? So um, when I think about colorism, I think of it like a sort of favorable prejudice for people with lighter skin. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that separates colorism from just racism is that it often happens within our same ethnic and or racial groups, right? The fact that um, that colorism can happen within a community uh, by people that look just like us um, is, is something that I that um, I find really interesting um, and hoping that the conversation today that we can really uh, touch on some of these issues and and think about why that is and why these standards um, that are perpetuated by media and by the beauty industry um, really have such an effect on the way that we see ourselves and the way that we want the world to see us. So, excited to be here today. Great, thank you. Um, uh, okay, well, I have a question for um, Brianna and Ayla. So how do racialized beauty standards play out in your work as uh, makeup artists? I mean, for me, like my mission um, is always to make people feel confident and seen um, and feel beautiful, you know? And I, majority of my clients are like dark skinned women. So um, part of my job is just making sure um, they feel like they're enough, you know, um, because I think like even all the information that Lariah shared earlier, um, I think that these things are like the factors that really drive people to use these um, products. Um, also, it plays out in my work because I'm able to like see reliefs on like models faces when I walk in the door because a lot of the times like models complain um, all the times for fashion week, um, like they had a makeup artist who matched them with the wrong foundation. And I hear like so many horror stories. And then seeing me as a dark skinned girl, um, for me personally, for my kit, um, I use like a, a wide range of foundation. So I have the darkest of the darkest, I have um, even the lightest of the lightest. So I have all shades in my kit and I really make that like a thing you know um when I worked at Macy's as a beauty advisor um I noticed that they didn't really have um like for example bare minerals they didn't have um a darker skin tone than me um it barely matched my skin tone and I thought that was like absolutely ridiculous but then we have brands now like Fenty and Rihanna who are like really trying to change um, shade inclusiveness and also um, representation, whether it be the models who she chooses for her shoots and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so just be like picking out products. I'm like very aware that I have all shades. Um, and then also I know for a fact, like just, just being there and being like a dark skin makeup artist is just, you know, representation enough and just knowing how to work with black skin in general. So. What about you, Ayla? 
Yeah, I have to piggyback off that. I definitely agree. Um, I work with a lot of models and I have a lot of models as friends and they always complain about having an experience where it was either someone who they knew what they were doing, but they just didn't have the products available to complete the task or they really didn't have the education or experience behind it. And uh, even working on different film sets and TV sets is, is generally the same thing. Like if we have talent that is of color or anything like that, they feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more safe with somebody who they can identify with because they kind of understand what to do in each scenario. Like, you know, if my hair is like this, what should I do? You know what I mean? Or if we're leading towards this, I'll trust you to know how to get there safely, you know, so to where I'll look good on camera, but I'll also leave here, you know, intact with my hair, you know, and with my skin feeling okay, you know what I mean? And um, I've, I've just been through a lot of situations where I've seen some really, really interesting things. And I, I do, in my experience, feel like it's a lack of experience, but also a lack of education because it's really not available right now, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've been hearing about this issue of uh, inappropriate makeup, uh, forget even hair for uh, darker skinned uh, models and actors. I mean, if you, uh, the other day, I think I was watching like a Law and Order episode from the 90s and there was a dark skinned uh, female actress on there and the makeup was terrible. <laughs> they clearly did not have her foundation shade, but I, um, I this has been, you know, uh, uh, Brianna, you brought up the uh, topic, of, you brought up Fenty, um, uh, Rihanna's um, makeup line, and when she brought it out, she brought out every single shade from lightest to darkest in one fell swoop, and there's not very many who've done that, I think, maybe some other brand that is comparable is, is MAC, perhaps, but everyone else complains, like, oh, there's not enough market demand, this and that, and she just did it in one fell swoop and said, whatever. Uh, I I recall I used to wear um, a Clinique uh, shade of, of something and I uh, was living in Europe at the time and Clinique is a major international brand. I ran out of it. I was like, yeah, I'll go to the department store. I mean, I'm living in a major city in Brussels. I could not find it anywhere. I actually, I had to get my mom to send it from uh from Canada to, to, to me, my shade of makeup, um, which is ridiculous because uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not even that dark uh, skinned and there's a lot of people with my skin shade. I mean, I'm South Asian, there's like a billion of us with my skin shade. How are you not um, <laughs> carrying, you know, my color? It's, uh, it's wild, but um, it's only really recently and it's still, still very much a problem. Um, so, for Annabelle and Brianna, because you both work with youth and on youth issues, how have you seen colorism play out in your work with uh, youth in the community? Well, I guess it's for Annabelle. <laughs> Brianna may have had oh, a check. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I work with, I've had the privilege of working with a youth council at the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, and these are amazing young people. Uh, when they were given the option to think about what issues they want to tackle when we first uh, sort of put this council together, they decided to name themselves the environmental health and justice advocates, because they were all really passionate about just that, like identifying these issues of racial disparities in their communities and doing something about it. Um, and uh, so I think that young people are really moving this conversation of colorism forward in a way that has never happened before. Um, I mean, I think back to my own personal experiences, like growing up Dominican and, 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 you know, in your introduction, you briefly mentioned some of it, but thinking about the fact that, you know, I, I always identified as Dominican. I was, I'm first generation. My family moved to the United States in the seventies and my mom in the eighties. And, um, you know, as a young adult, I, I, I just always knew I'm black, you know, I'm Latina, I'm Dominican, but I'm Black. And it was clear to me um, because I identified more closely often with my Black peers, whether they're maybe African-American, Jamaican, uh, even and other Black Latinos than I did with white Latinos or fair-skinned Latinos. My experience was much more closely aligned with those of my peers because we sort of had the same lived experience of you know, um, having to 
try to fit in to a mold that society wants us to fit into uh, of these sort of Eurocentric beauty standards, like straight hair and, you know, light eyes, um, you know. And so I think that youth today uh, is so much more aware of these sort of kitchen table conversations that we have that that sort of intrinsic within the family, um, you know, colorism that is happening, you know, where mom will say, oh, she's so pretty. Look at her with her porcelain skin. And she had the prettiest blue eyes and oh my God, and her little soft blonde curls. And then at the same time, you have the black daughter in the same family, right? And um, it's like, you know, you don't hear those same terms. Oh, your beautiful brown eyes and your beautiful big curls. And I remember talking to uh, one of my family members and saying, do you, do you realize that you're doing this? Like your daughter is hearing this. And I realized this is where we're playing the we, right? And you're supposed to make sort of an avatar of yourself. And she made herself white. And I said, wait, that, you know, there's different skin colors. You can actually pick yours. And she's like, no, no, this is the one I want. I'm like, but you're not, you're brown. And, and it was like, it was this conversation of, no, no, this is, this is the one I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that talking with members of my youth council and some of their experiences, those are a lot of the very same things that they're dealing with. Um, and they are moving, moving forward, um, you know, with talking to their parents and talking, having these kitchen table conversations that are really um, bringing race uh, and skin color and colorism and this bias that exists, um, you know, to the forefront. So, yeah. Is Brianna back on? No, I, uh, okay. I, don't know I can she... keep talking, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, unless somebody else uh, would like to chime in or has similar experiences. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, a lot of what you said really uh, spoke to me because it's, it's kind of this like a uh, double, double whammy, right? So first of all, if you are a person of color growing up, um, especially, you know, as a say, uh, first generation immigrant or something like that, growing up here uh, where, um, you know, I, I grew up in the eighties and nineties. And so we didn't have a lot of diversity in fashion or, or beauty and, I didn't really see anyone um, who looked like me. And so that already formed my uh, vision of what was supposed, what, how beauty was defined. As a kid in kindergarten, I literally thought the only way uh, beauty could be defined was if you were light skinned, blonde, and blue eyes. I remember I had a classmate, I mean, this is a kindergarten kid, and she was kind of like hair like this and just wild. I'm like, how come she gets to be beautiful? but like someone like my sister or my mom will never be considered uh, beautiful. And then, you know, maybe you, you start to grow out of that or, uh, you know, maybe more representation happens, but then within your own community, suddenly you're, you're faced with um, this kind of uh, concepts of beauty where um, you have to, uh that they're like oh yeah like this this fair skin so nice so and I heard it constantly also uh um and uh you know uh in South Asian families as I said you can get a whole range of skin tones so my uh sister my uh brother are a lot more fair than me and you know you hear oh like such so, such so fair such fair skin um so it, it's difficult because you have it from without but also from within your community as well and and to piggyback off that, this idea of within the community, right, where when you do, uh, when you are proud of what you look like and you think your skin is beautiful and you say, well, I'm black and, you know, um, where there is sometimes this pushback where it's like, you're not black, you're Latina, like you're Latin or you're Latin X, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not black, you're Dominican, like, and somehow by being proud of being black, it's equated to not being proud of being Dominican, if that makes sense, or, or proud of being a Latina in my case. And so I had to, you know, I think it's it's constant conversations around the kitchen tables. I've brought my mother over. Uh, I still deal with this with a lot of other family, you know, um, and, and when you read between the lines, it's they're telling you stop being black, stop espousing black culture in a, in a nutshell, like this idea of Latino and black are in conflict with each other, like you can't be both, you know, um, and, and so that's, that's a really, 
thank you for for bringing that up because yeah it, it, it's like this identity struggle of trying to assert your blackness and saying you know what when i go out into the world america sees me as a black woman they don't say no 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 she's she's a dominican you know she's different um i am a black woman and i'm proud to be a black woman and i'm i'm proud of the way that i look you know and i think it's beautiful right i love all different shades of skin <laughs> um brianna's back so i think yeah, sorry uh, um, for your technical difficulties, but Brianna, you wanted to add anything about your work with youth and how you've seen colorism play out? Um, yeah, um, for me on like on the teaching side, like when I'm with the students, I think like while I'm working, I just make it um, a point to have these certain like conversations inside the classroom. Um, also, um, within my presentations, I also make sure I show images that reflect that. So like, um, if we're doing something, I'll make sure that the character um, or like the gift that I'm using is um, someone of a dark person. And I'll make sure I use like different skin tones um, in my presentation. And then also, um, we do have like certain conversations. So like, I know in our, we have one unit where we talk about social justice and students um, pick different issues in which they're passionate about. And um, colorism is one of the things that they, that they can choose from. And I do think like talking with our youth about this to make sure that they, you know, know, well, one, the language for it and two, um, what it means and how they can, um, how they can, I guess, like make things better, you know? Um, and then also um, with the youth, I also make sure that I like, you know, I guess I like push them to make sure that they feel comfortable um, within their skin. So like um, I'll do exercises where I ask them to list three things that they like or love about themselves. And um, that's just something um, small. So I'll be like, even today I did that when we have classes. And I noticed like there was one kid in particular who he was dark skinned, but I don't, you know, but um, he didn't find anything that he liked about himself. And it was like a difficult thing for him to do. So I like just sort of like pushed him to like sort of just find little things. And I think doing those things, especially with black and brown students is really important because a lot of the times like they don't get to identify with like even those conversations, like, what do I like about myself? Um, and uh, and they all have access to social media. So it's just like, they see so many different images and it's just like, um, they're really at the age of about 13 or 14 where they have so much stuff pushed in their face. So um, like having the conversations like that and doing activities um, where we're discussing about things that we like about ourselves. And then also showing that in my presentation in media is how I, just sort of um, push that inside the classroom. Um, so this is a question for everyone. Uh, the findings of the study or the discussion on colorism in general, how has that motivated you to do something differently with the work you do? Um, bit of a challenging question, but uh, I don't know, TK, do you, do you have any um, viewpoints on that? Um, yeah, sure. Um... So knowing more about um, how colorism pr produces these like unfavorable health health outcomes and informs like this overconsumption, really toxic beauty products. Um, it has uh, made me when I'm presenting these ideas and findings to my community, I'm very careful not to um, sort of administer blame to the black woman who unfortunately do succumb to this consumption of toxic products. I really like to ground um, research like this and ideas like this um, with just like much needed historical context. Like this is not happening within a vacuum, this overconsumption. Um, people are not waking up one day and deciding to um, just actively put their health at risk. I found this to be really important, especially when um, the there was a recent study that came out about hair relaxers and um, the just awful negative health impacts of that. And I found that when some media outlets were reporting on it, there was a lot of blame, like in comment section, like you got, 
blame as in, well, you guys know now that um, this is so harmful. Why are you guys still opting into these kind of products? But I, I think it's really important to understand what a beast beauty is and how just influential beauty is and how no one is necessarily opting out of beauty. We all are invested in some type of beautification process or beautifying ourselves. And for a lot of people, beautification has become survival, um, which has become really important to the anti-colorism work I even do because um, as like with the work I do, I'm interacting with people who will like proudly say they skin bleach, you know, and they are aware of the benefits that come with skin bleaching. And I have had to learn how to even be advocates for those people, even though I am a dark skinned um, black woman. So um, when I first started this work, I couldn't help but to be offended because I'm like, what do you mean you skin bleach? Like, what do you mean you want to be like lighter skin? Like, what does that mean for me? But um, at this point of my work, I realized that we are all trying our best and we are all unfortunately faring differently and we will all arrive at different times um, to these realizations that black is beautiful, darker skin is beautiful and media and um, what we see being idealized as the pinnacle of beauty um, that starts affecting us at a very, very, very young age. I remember reading Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye and it was the first time I wrote a book that really articulated how it felt like to be a little dark skinned black girl where you feel like no one is really in your corner no one really understands you have to sort of shrink yourself to make space for the little girls people think is are pretty and um just holding so much of that trauma and that like weight and that burden um it has like reflecting on my experiences as a little dark skinned black girl it has really taught me that how to humanize um, Black women who um, unfortunately succumb to the pressures and how to, um, if I'm going to facilitate a conversation about the very harmful, tangible health impacts of these toxic beauty products, how not to make it a blame game of wake up, like obviously this is bad for you. Um, like why can't you get it together? Why can't you um, prioritize your health over approximating these beauty standards, these Eurocentric beauty standards. It's not as easy as that. So um, it's taught me a lot of like humility and how to be really sensitive um, to how um, I'm even trying to like conduct these conversations. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, what about you, Lariah? How do you feel you might approach your work differently now? I think I definitely want to piggyback on what TK said in terms of so many people ask, um, when I generally publish papers talking about, you know, chemicals found, whether it be in your food or your, your products, that I then ask, well, how do I reduce my exposure? And first acknowledging that um, it is, while um, not placing blame, right? You can only do so much to reduce your exposure because of just the way chemical policy is in our country, the way products or even food are regulated. And then of course, the added layer of, you know, just the social structural factors that exist in our country. Um, and someone mentioned, you know, the, the new Modernization of Cosmetic Regulation Act in the chat and how that is a much needed step forward in regulating our personal care um, and cosmetic products by FDA because the previous cosmetic regulations by FDA are very, very, we're very, very outdated before this new regulation passed in December. And it's a step forward, um, but I would have loved to see maybe actually banning specific ingredients like, you know, mercury or phthalates or formaldehyde and the act doesn't do things like that. So letting people know that unfortunately, given the way that uh, cosmetics and products are regulated, the onus is on you to reduce your exposure. You have to go out there and scrutinize your labels and then maybe go online and read this and do that. And it shouldn't be that way. The products on our shelves should be safe and healthy for us to use. It shouldn't require us to go through all of these, you know, all these hoops and try to have to decode ingredient labels and wonder if the company is being um, 
forthcoming and honest with their marketing of, you know, this is green, this is vegan, this is all natural, and that shouldn't be the case. And then, of course, recognizing that, you know, that person who is, you know, using mercury laden products to bleach their skin, that is no need to place blame because we, they didn't, like TK said, they didn't just wake up and decide, I'm going to use toxic products on my, on my skin. I'm going to expose myself to mercury. It is, there are layers and layers of um, other things to peel back and discuss first rather than placing blame. So I think that is definitely one um, area that I like to take forward in my work. And also thinking about people who, um, not just women who use makeup, but also people of other gender identities. They are not often represented in papers. And so their use of these products and the relationship with these products aren't captured, which means they're not really studied. So we don't understand how maybe the, the chemicals in these products affect those who identify as different gender. So I think that is something that I would like to move forward and think about in my work. Okay. Um, just to know, I think we. Um, I'd like to add it. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, we managed to fix the the chat function, I believe. Um, so if you want to add any comments in there, uh, make sure that it's sent to everyone, and you can use the chat function. Sorry, Annabelle, go ahead. As I said, like I said, you know, I completely agree with um something that both uh, Lariah and TK said with regards to you know it isn't all about the individual onus when we're talking about colorism and we're talking about these it's it's not the fault of any one person i think that um there's a lot of misleading marketing that exists out there that our the global beauty industry um is responsible for a lot of those messages that are put out there um and and i want to clarify that the experience of being black and latino in the United States is different and unique for each of us. So uh, when I was asked to speak today, you know, I was thinking really deeply about that. And when I'm speaking, I'm speaking about my own personal perspectives and my own family. Um, and yet, being Black and Latino, there's a lot of common themes. I think that colorism is one of those. And I'm hoping that through like the science and studies like this, through community conversations and community involvement, involvement in like the environmental justice issues um, that we can foster a better understanding about what colorism is and how it has very real impact on, uh, you know, the decisions that we make, um, you know. Um, and when I think about it, my personal experience, again, is as a Dominican-American family, first emigrated, immigrated to the United States in the early 80s. And I lived my early life traveling between New York and the Dominican Republic. So I'm very proud of my Latin language, food, culture. I definitely understand that Dominicans particularly and, and many others are mixed with so many things. But today's conversation is about colorism and you know, sort of skin tone biases that do exist in many of our communities. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. Yeah. Definitely. Um, thanks uh, to, to all three of you for that. I uh, um, I wanted to say to the point of not assigning blame, I mean, this was uh, something that, you know, we think about in um, the campaign as well as how to get people to understand uh, uh, about, uh, you know, using hair relaxers or skin lightening creams. And, you know, when you see the results from our surveys, I say people are more motivated by how they view, uh, how others view um, relaxed hair, um, and, uh, and they think it's more professional or this and that, you know, it's very difficult to, and it's really not the right approach to say, Hey, you're harming yourself because you need a job first and foremost, right? You need to be able to get a job. And if you honestly think that, um, you know, if you show up with your hair in a, in a natural hairstyle, um, that you won't get that job, that you won't be treated uh, well at your work, then, uh, it, you know, that such as, such as that, that's going to be your priority over others. And so it's important to, to really understand that and, and, and how you take that approach. And, um, I think, you know, we've taken sort of like a harm reduction approach here. These are all, uh, this is, what these products can do to you. Um, this is what your surrounding environment uh, does to you in terms of your exposure to toxins. So think about how you want to, um, you know, expose yourself and, and how you want to manage your exposure. 
Um, I guess, uh, you know what, that would lead me to uh, this question, the next question, um, and just a background on that. Uh, in December, so speaking of policy and regulation and chemicals policy, in December, Governor Hocho um, signed the mercury out of cosmetics bill, and we act, worked on that with our partners in the Just Green Partnership. And this ban bill bans the sale on both online and in person of cosmetics and personal care products that contain mercury, which are used for skin lightening. So a question, I guess, to everyone, um, how do you think these findings could influence policies or what kind of policies would you like to see that you think could help address the issue of colorism? How about you, TK, if you have any ideas of policies that could help? We have, for example, the Crown Act, right? So that helps re uh, uh, reduce or address the issue of um, uh, hair discrimination um, and, you know, ho maybe hopefully helps uh, motivate people to not use hair relaxers uh, just for the purpose of, you know, looking professional or getting a job. But um, what other policies do you think um, would help address, uh, you know, colorism in the beauty industry? And, and... Yeah, um, I think, um, well, I've recently become familiar with the work of Trina Jones. She's a professor of law at Duke. And um, I had an opportunity to collaborate with her in my final semester of college. And her work involves um, trying to really get the legal system to um, recognize interracial disparity as something um, um, people can go forward with and have complaints about. And because right now it's very black or white and like man or woman, like people are not um, filing discrimination claims and winning against like with like colorism and like and other intraracial or intra group discrimination. So I think um, something that would really help like policies that uh, would help fight against colorism is this greater understanding in the legal system that interracial disparities do exist because I think everyone here understands they exist and everyone here is invested in um, undoing those disparities. But I think to the greater public where the greater public isn't as far as long as, long as like understanding that it, it's not just racism, it's also colorism, it's also fat phobia, it's also like ableism and it's also, um, all of these like there are multiple ways black people can experience discrimination differently other than oh you're black he's black so you guys just experience um racism and anti-blackness i think that um that like greater transformation of how our like society's racial consciousness or like how society like even understands discrimination and oppression is something that just not that just doesn't um, exist broadly between groups, but can also be reinforced like within groups um, is going to really help with pushing that some some of that policy and imagining um, greater policy. But I, I think um, things like the Crown Act are really like exciting because um, again, you're saying like, as you said, if it's gonna cost you a job, like how you wear your hair, you're gonna prioritize like your job, you know, and like you're gonna prioritize being in good standing with your job and and whatever is gonna help you survive in this world. So um, it's not that like people are just waking up deciding to put their health at risk is that it's people are weighing their options and there are so many incentives to put your health at risk if it means um, you're going to reduce the pressure you feel from being um, someone that is not perceived as like immediately like conventionally beautiful in society and the economic consequences of that and the personal ramifications of that. Um, so maybe something like the Crown Act that like targets um, um, lighter skinned, um, like discrimination against darker skinned individuals. But before that even becomes a thing, I think there needs to be precedent in the legal system where people are coming forward with complaints about being discriminated because of their skin tone, not just because of their race. Mm -hmm. And we as a society have to um, treat that very seriously before um, people can really understand 
um, that colorism is real and it, and it, it exists. And it's something we should um, treat as seriously as we treat um, other oppression um, people are, are more familiar with. Definitely. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, um, I, I do think that you really made some really good points, TK. Um, it's not just like colorism, it's not just racism. Um, it does also have a lot to do with hair and um, I don't know if texturism is a thing, but um, yeah, and the Crown Act is really important, but I do think that something that can influence policy is also um, media and how we um, distribute these images, because I do think like people drive policy and um, people just need to like see themselves and be represented in media. So like, um, if you look at like certain shows, like my favorite thing to like my, one of my favorite examples is like the Will Smith show, like with the Aunt Viv switch out and stuff like that. And it's just like, um, I think with the, with those type of messaging is just, it's just showing like lighter skin is more preferable than black skin. And I do think like, um, with the, with these shows, we, it's our responsibility to, to showcase black women in front of the screen, but also behind the screen too. So like, who's writing these things, who's working on set. And I do think that that does have a direct correlation with um, how people sort of view themselves and the direct action that they take. Because um, even like I said earlier, a lot of my students are on social media all day or they're watching TV or they're watching movies. So I do think that people sort of need to be seen in certain places to sort of start asking themselves these questions like, hey, why, why don't I see a black teacher in my school, right? When I just saw a movie about it last night. Oh, why don't I see a black doctor or, or something like that? Um, and, and yeah, just start just asking themselves and just being more aware about it. And I think um, media is something that so many people play, um, so many people pay attention to and it comes in different forms, whether that be in music, right? And rap music, um, I know like in the hip hop, um, culture, the term red bone and high yellows used a lot. And um, these, these kids are like, you know, these young generation and even, you know, myself and um, we really take it in and it does provide a certain messaging. So I think um, we do need to um, do a better job at representation in media um, be in front and behind the camera. So definitely. Anyone else wanted to add anything? Um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and look at I definitely agree with what she just said because um, a lot of times when I'm on set, there there is certain changes that have been put in place to make it seem like um, a certain brand has a level of, of inclusivity that they don't really uh, strive to live by. Mm -hmm. So there will be... Um, you know, a black and a white model there, but then there's also no Asians, no Latinx, there's nobody in between there. And not only that, these are only the the models that they've hired, but these are not the people who are in the boardroom or who are in the uh, lab creating these products for us. So a policy that kind of um, creates some inclusivity in the uh, boardroom, but also, in the lab, you know, while you're making the products, mm -hmm. there's been brands that also reach out to get a uh, uh, certain perspectives from a black perspective or from a LGBTQ perspective, but it doesn't really uh, change the formula of the actual product. So it's not really designed with you in mind. It's just designed with your opinion in mind. Yeah. So. Some brands have reached out to say like, hey, we see that this is the issue. We would love to get your opinion in the creation process. But then I also think that um, I, I just would love to see that those uh, suggestions and those testimonies that are out there are being taken into consideration during the creation of all of these products. Yeah, yeah, it, it's more a box ticking exercise than an inclusivity exercise. So. Uh, I was gonna lead into another question for you and Brianna, but I'll I'll go I'll get back to you because Brianna unfortunately had another uh, tech issue. So um uh this is more for so this question is for Laraya. Um, what research gaps do you think there are on this topic? Um, do you think there's other ways we could research this issue? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think really just more research like this because it, you know, unfortunately, um, there's these discussions about, you know, what policy could be could be put into place to help protect us. And TK and others mentioned, you know, these policies that address all these different discrimination, discriminatory practices. And I feel like sometimes what those policymakers want to see, they want to see the data that says X drives this, it's significant, it's been published and peer-reviewed. And so it's unfortunate that's that that is what is what is required sometimes. It should be taken seriously. But if, so if we're going to play that game, then absolutely more data in this area entirely. Mm-hmm. And then as I mentioned earlier, just more when we think about particularly exposure to chemicals from heavy use of makeups and cosmetic products, like we talk a lot about women. Women are consumers of this, blah, 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 blah. What about everybody else who chooses to wear makeup to express themselves? for work, for all of these other areas of life that they are not being considered, they're not being included. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a very important area. As TK mentioned, not everybody can check a box and say, yes, I'm man, woman, whatever. Like that, that is not, uh, we are breaking free of that very binary way of thinking. And that is great. And so those folks who uh, you know don't check those boxes to identify as different gender identities need to be included in these data so that they, so we know what's happening to them. So maybe we can have policies, we can drive change so that everybody's protected because right now not everybody is protected. And a lot of this stuff out there says like, women are left unprotected. Yes, women, but also countless other people are left unprotected. So there needs to be research and data that protects them as well. Yeah, for sure. Even within the the, um, binary uh, thinking, uh, you know, uh, personal care products for men, makeup, hair care products, that market has been expanding. You see a lot more marketing towards that, um, but very little about that discussion as well of the health impacts. What are in these products? Are they safe for you to use? Um, Absolutely. Mention ev- everyone else who doesn't, you know, fit or identify within that box. Um, so uh, going back, so I wanted to build on um, what we were talking about before. Uh, A love and Brianna, if you've seen any changes in the industry yourself um, in regards to colorism since you've started. I have seen um, some changes in regard to like representation, like I mentioned earlier with Rihanna's Fenty um, campaign. Um, And I do think like we have, um, like even in media, we have actresses like Lupita um, who's in Black Panther. We have like, you know, we are making small strides, um, but I do think like we sort of like have a long way to go. Um, And some things I do think that we can do to like promote change is like, you know, talking to our youth about it um, and also developing language for it. Um, I know like even before Alice Walker even coined the term colorism, it didn't even exist. So like making sure that um, we, we're having these conversations with, with students. Um, and then like for me, um, I just make sure I make it a point to like post black women um, to drive, I guess some, some type of change because like I've been told before in the past, like hey, um, you, should diver- you should diversify your page because you have so many like black women on your page. And I'm like, well, I don't think like my white counterparts are like, you know, are being told the same thing, you know? So um, I think like just doing things like that can definitely promote change. But yeah, I have seen change in representation, which I am liking, but um, I would definitely like to see more change. Um, in, in media, especially, and even in the cosmetic industry um, with, with certain brands, um, with inclusivity, with products and um, foundations and just certain things that work for our skin because it's not just even foundation. Like there will be certain like lipsticks or um, like you'll have a whole line of cosmetics and maybe only two lipsticks or a couple of lipsticks looks good on black women, but majority of them are not meant for, you know, black women. So I do think like having conversations like this are, are really important um, to just bring awareness to it. So um, I, I have seen change, but like I, like I said, I would like to see more. What about you, Ayla? Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, kind of the piggybacking off of the 
the topic of Rihanna's brand. So when she came out with Fenty Beauty, it was so crazy because a lot of brands uh, immediately rushed to, it was a need. It was a need for a lot of, of more colors. It was a need for a lot more inclusivity. And a lot of brands heard that and they all rushed to it. And I think that during that time, like even when you would go in and shop, the way that the shopping experience was, it was completely different. Um, when you would look for certain colors and things like that, normally, traditionally, it would be, they would ascend from lightest to darkest. And when she came out with her brand, they all kind of switched over to where the darker shades were first. You would automatically see that. And now, I think it's going back to the traditional ways where it's like, it's not really like a trend anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of people are like, well, you know, I'm not really on that bandwagon or that's not really like the trend that we're focusing on right now. And I think that the change that I want to see is that it's not really like a trend. It's more of like, this is a staple, like this is what we focus on. This is who we are. And I think, um, having brands like Danessa Myers Beauty or Pat McGrath, uh, Fenty, um, seeing those changes be made and knowing that these are the four, uh, the the people who are really in the forefront of the makeup business and like everything that we know and perceive as beautiful, these are the people who kind of create those images for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that and seeing that change is, a, it is a, a, a really big win for us. But again, I, I was I still would love to see more. Yeah, um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, just to add on to that, um, especially like with like the Fenty and um, and just even just certain like media, I do think like it shouldn't just be a trend. Like even the fact that Fenty stands out, or um, for example, like even the new reboot of the Will Smith um, show, they have like an all black family where. You have um, uh, what was her name? The girl, the I think her name was Vivian, um, Hillary. I'm sorry, she's a dark skinned girl now, played by Coco Jones. And um, I think like it's it's great that we have that, but it shouldn't just be like okay, now a character is um making this much noise because it should just be something that we see every day. So um, I do think that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, someone in the chat said that, you know, a lot of things uh, sometimes come uh, are out of the scope of legislation. And so as you both talked about is, you know, representation uh, in decision making on screen in media. But to your point, Brianna, so often um, and to yours, a love about trend so often it is not represented as just natural. Like here we have, you know, someone who is uh, representative of a bigger size or a uh, darker skin, it has to be made a whole thing. And when it's a whole thing, then obviously that, that trend falls out. Um, and to that point, I prefer the original Aunt Viv. I don't know if that's a controversial point, but I thought she was much better. <laughs> so um, we're gonna move on to the uh, Q and A from um, the audience and, uh, the first question I wanted to ask, which builds, um, I think builds well on the uh, the conversation we've been having, is how do you think we act should work with um, women to reduce demand for some of these toxic products? What do you guys think? Uh, to start you off, I think uh, importantly is um, education and having um, these discussions, right? Like we said, it might be uh, difficult to legislate um, interracial discrimination, for example, uh, you know, when it gets down to the practicality of how you write something like that into law, it's uh, it's not so easy, right? Um, and so having conversations about what colorism is, that it exists, that it can have an impact um, uh, within communities, not just uh, between different um, uh, ethnicities uh, is, is really important. Things like what TK is doing um, and uh, people who work within the industry like Alev and Brianna advocating and, and bringing these discussions up, um, I think is, is one way to make people aware that this is an issue and then to, to help them understand that, you know, why are you buying these products? Are you buying them because you really truly like relaxed hair? You think you look, um, you love it, you like the way you look with it? 
um, and then understanding the uh, health impacts that has to look the way you like, or are you buying it because you want others and how, you know, what is the, the impact of letting others discriminate or discriminatory um, viewpoints uh, having on your health, you know, and how you can address that in your own way. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to that or any other ways they could approach it? I also think it would be helpful to, um, because like beauty is this game that um, it's it's like really hard to opt out of just because of like the immense societal pressure that's placed on um, people to, you know, um, appropriate, approximate beauty standards. I think um, trying to offer less harmful alternatives, um, I think in a perfect world, um, everyone who is born with non-straight hair can fully embrace that hair or like everyone who is born with dark, darker skin can like truly embrace that skin. But um, letting people know if they are going to opt into this beautification that um, idealizes a certain standard, maybe they don't have to run to the relaxer or they don't have to run to the... Um, the skin lightening cream. Um, maybe they don't have to run to the like the extreme that has the most um, negative health effects. Um, I, I think like like putting the agency back in people's hands to like educate them first of all, and then um, just asking them like, well, you have this power over how you beautify yourself. Like ultimately, you get to decide. Like if you are going to beautify yourself, um, if the pressure um, um, is not something you feel like you can overcome right now in your life. There are alternatives that don't have to be the most toxic um, way of achieving this, this beautification. And I also think educating people not only about colorism and how it exists, but how these companies and use um, are being particularly predatory um, towards um, darker skinned um, Black people and just uh, people of color and how they're um, advertising to um, darker skinned people of color with almost surgical precision. And I think um, when people are empowered with that knowledge, they can sort of see that it all is a game, you know, and these products, um, your maybe your attraction to these products have less to do about like your own personal beliefs and more about what you're consuming on social media and where you're consuming through these advertisements. And I particularly see that um, I, I recently, like I was looking at advertisements about like skin bleaching products um, in India and the advertisements are a lot more like overt. So they're, I, I feel like the advertisements here, um, they might be more discreet and like idealizing lighter skinned, but in some countries, the advertisements will very um, like verbatim say like lighter skin is more ideal lighter skin is more beautiful um so just empowering people to know that this is a game like companies are playing and they're not really invested in what makes you feel beautiful they want you to buy their products so they're going to exploit colorism and futurism and texturism and all the isms and they are banking that those isms survive and that you have those um that you do internalize those beauty ideals to buy their products. So you're not necessarily, they're not on your side and you should reject them <laughs> with all your might, which is obviously easier said than done, but um, I think it is possible. Yeah, um, bringing up the point of advertising in India and other countries, uh, it reminds me of uh, when I uh, went to Thailand uh, many years ago and, uh, you know, I thought, oh, well, because at the time I was uh, living in Europe, which was void of anything uh, in my skin tone. So I thought, oh, okay, now I'm in Thailand, like, uh, you know, people have my skin tone here, I can buy uh, some makeup or, or whatever. And that was not at all the case. Um, first of all, all the billboards, no one looked Thai at all. I was like, where who are these people? Uh, they, they do not walk amongst you um, in the department stores. I was like, I don't know who is buying this. These, uh, it's not anyone I've seen outside. And I mean, it was blatant. It was just like, I don't know who you think that is compared to who is here on the street um, at all. And, you know, it's the the very same brands, it's your Estee Lauders and your um, L'Oreal's and everything who are selling here. And as Alev um, mentioned, are preaching something 
And then they're out in foreign markets, uh, really just going hard on, um, uh, you know, lighter skin and colorism and Eurocentric standards of beauties in, in places where, you know, there's no Europeans to begin with, like there's no, uh, or a very minimal um, uh, market. Um, even when I was trying to buy a skin cream, everything was about brightening, which I took to mean like full on lightening. And um, this was before I knew about the chemicals in them. So I can't imagine what was in them, um, which brings to the point that since, uh, you know, a lot of action is very performative, as we said. Um, what are your thoughts on how we could create systemic change? So not just within policies and things like that, but using this idea of outreach and education and media representation, how do you think we can implement that um, to create systemic change? I think um, teaming up with different uh, chemists, different brands, even uh, different industry professionals, and creating, uh, like I, someone said, just uh, other options, finding out what else is available, what else is out there, what else could we use? And I think that um, opening up the conversation about what it is that we truly, truly want as a society versus what we are perceived to want. Because I think that these are things that are offered to us, but a lot of times these are not the things that we truly want. You know what I mean? We all wanna look good and feel good, but if that's not available to us, then what is it that we need, you know? And I think that if we can nurture those conversations and have more dialect around that, then I feel like we can uh, get to a better place and have more of a, uh, a more longevity, not just in media, but then also too, in where these places are called, like in beauty school, you know, there's really no, um, differentiation on the type of texture that you learn in beauty school and you definitely don't really learn about different skin tones and textures and things like that. So I, I think that starting with that will create the change in the future for those things as well. That's a good point about beauty school. I believe I've had that conversation before about what are they teaching in beauty schools? Um, and this was related just to toxic chemicals in general, but also about how how do you you know deal with different hair textures? What about you, Lariah? What do you um what do you think? I think honestly, creating systemic change just really means let's keep talking about it. So someone in the chat mentioned cross-generational conversations. And I know Annabelle mentioned bringing her mom into these conversations. And so I think that is absolutely the way to go. And it's also important while we, you know, addressed maybe that addressing the fact that maybe our you know, our elders have done harm in this area to us. So let's talk about that and address it, but also educating our youth on these issues and making it very clear because while I do feel like um, the youth are talking about this, I also go to TikTok and I see, you know, trends like the clean beauty trend or the vanilla girl trend or all these other trends that just hyper um, promote this white feminine beauty. Um, and so there needs to be this constant discussion with the youth about what is going on. And I think at WEAC with your environmental health and justice leadership training program, we start to have these conversations about, you know, beauty and justice and colorism and all of these problems. And I, you know, I've been fortunate to receive funding from, from NYU to can do this work to make sure that the youth are hearing these lessons in ways that are accessible to them. Um, so whether that is breaking down a TikTok trend or some viral clean trend you're seeing online and being like, what is, what's wrong with this? Like who are, who is this trend hyper focusing and putting on the forefront on display? So I really think conversation, um, conversation is the way to go. So eventually these these youth will grow up and they won't accept it. They'll they'll see TV shows that don't feature any dark skinned people and be like, well, I'm not watching that. Um, or they'll go to stores where they can't find their foundation color and be like, and they'll, you know, they'll blast the, the, the brand on TikTok or social media. And I think that is, that's the way to go. It's empowering youth that this is a problem. Use your voice, use the multitude of platforms that you can to share your voice to really, um, keep this discussion going and force change and kind of force people to recognize this is not just a trend. It's something that we are advocating for. We're not going to, um, not gonna let up on. 
And I'll say, I mean, I, I noticed a trend within the Q&A and in the chat, um, you know, talking about education being important, yes, but um, sort of grounding some of this conversation in social, cult cultural, historical context, um, talking about some of the, the, the roots of where this colorism has stemmed from, colonialism, um, Maricela wrote in the chat, and also someone in the Q&A talked about the importance of making distinction between nationality, ethnicity, culture, and race. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think this is why when I was speaking, I, I tried to pin my examples to my own personal experiences because experiences vary widely, um, but from family to family, even within the same family, right? When we talk about colorism and when we talk about race and we talk about nationality and all of these social constructs, right, uh, of identity. Um, and so I think that, that, yes, having these conversations is so important um, because I think that through these conversations that we're able to, to really get to the bottom line of what, what is it we're trying to achieve here um, through this, right? And, and it's really about improving health outcomes, uh, reducing toxic exposures um, that our communities are, are, you know, that are happening within our community. And, and the root of it comes from these social constructs, right? With these ideas of what is beautiful. Um, and, and yeah, so multiculturalism is beautiful. I, I completely agree. I, you know, I talked about myself as Black and Latina. That is how I identify myself, you know, and um, Dominican culture is so, so broad and so mixed, right? Um, and, and yeah, you know, we have Taino heritage, we have European heritage, we have, and so some of these conversations can tend to become, um, how do I say, uh, I don't, I don't want to use the wrong word, but when we're talking within our own communities, often there's sort of pushback when we hear some of these things like, you know, what I've personally experienced racism within my own community, within Dominican uh, community in New York City, within uh, other groups as well, within Latin groups. And, and that's, that's my personal experience, you know. I feel like it's important to really frame a lot of what we talk about um, into what's affecting us as a society as a whole. And that's that's very different from what my personal experience might be. So I just wanted to put that out there and hopefully maybe put it out for some of the other panelists if you have any similar um, things that you've dealt with uh, in having some of these conversations. Yeah. Uh, something that came up in the chat a lot was uh, to talk about multiculturalism is as mixed race um, and uh, denying, say, your background or, um, you know, having uh, being mixed race and, and approaching this, it, it, it can be a little more complicated. And, you know, uh, there, that is happening more and more. I know, like all my friends. Uh, children are mixed race and uh, the, the mix is, you know, it's starting to get more and more uh, elaborate and complicated. Um, uh, there's, a, well, complicated is a negative term there, but you know what I mean, where it's not as straight to define I'm this and I'm that, I'm this, but then my grandparents were this and this and this. Um, and so uh, it brings to the question, and it's a big one, how do you promote multiculturalism as beautiful? Told you it was a big question. <laughs> I think it's the same way though. Like we have the same conversations about, you know, um, that group as well. Like it's all about inclusion and inclusivity. Like is, is I think the best way to say it is just uh, to have them be represented just like everybody wants to be represented. Mm -hmm. Continuously seeing them in media and having products that speak to them as well. And um, and not really in like a fetishized way, because I feel like sometimes in media, it is really sought after to have, bi uh, to be biracial or to have like a multiracial situation. But I think that just really celebrating it and knowing like what it is and what the trajectory of it is and just promoting like, 
again, the, the whole idea of inclusivity and they're a part of this conversation, just like we all are. Yeah, and also to add to that, um, I do think that it is important to look at the root like Annabelle was saying and um, just make sure that these people know themselves and where they come from or just know how certain things are um, are like brought in your face today. So like, for example, um, people should know like, okay, how, how did colorism even begin, right? So like, um, we know that, you know, there were white slave owners who raped black women. Um, and then um, they had like lighter skinned kids and then the lighter skinned people were mostly working in a house while darker skinned people were seen fit for labor and stuff like that. And um, I do think like learning about where where your what your history is and where you come from is really important. And then also, um, I was I went to a panel about last year when we were talking about colorism as well. And I personally was surprised to find out that colorism does really happen a lot in other cultures as well because I didn't know that. Um, I didn't realize that even Hispanic. Um, there was a one girl who shared about how her grandma. Um, was telling her that like she's too dark and um, not to bring home a, a dark skinned man to have babies with and stuff like that. And it was just like, wow, I, I didn't realize that um, that even other cultures went through this on this level because I'm a dark skinned girl. So when I look at someone, you know, like a lighter skin, I'll probably think, OK, well, you know, since they're lighter than me, um, they might not face some of the same problems at home or um, socially that I do. But um, in reality, that's not true. So um, I think you're right, like A-Love said, continuing to have these conversations. So that way we are aware, because honestly, if I didn't go to that panel, I probably wouldn't have known how, um, how other maybe like Hispanic women feel inside their households, because um, she was really, really light, but she still experienced that on some level as well. So um, yeah, having these conversations for sure definitely helps. Yeah, uh, colorism is very pervasive in other countries. And then, uh, you know, when people uh, from those countries are, are growing up here, uh, unfortunately, those mentalities um, still persist uh, even within um uh the the US or or other you know uh in New York City etc um and uh it it's uh it can be very extreme um in some parts of the world and um those extreme uh viewpoints of how you should look and how you what you should do to obtain that look uh is um uh it 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 occurs over here um one issue especially is skin lightening creams um, you know, there are stories of people who make their own uh, because they're not able uh, to find, you know, the, the brand that uh, you might, they might use uh, back home, uh, bringing them from back home where there's, there's less regulation. And so, you know, it, uh, it's very important that we uh, look at not just as an umbrella, um, but to address it individually at each community level um, and to, to how they view colorism and how they uh, might perceive it. And absolutely, even um, within communities, you wouldn't think um, I have a uh, uh, a Mexican um, friend who I, I would say is is uh, fairer than me. And when I was telling her about my mom's experience uh, with colorism growing up, she said, yeah, my my siblings made fun of me uh, because I was dark skinned. I'm like, dark skinned where? I don't, I don't see it at all. <laughs> and so you can see how, uh, and I'm not even exaggerating really, you can see how pervasive this can get. Um, and and uh, cultures where you don't think how how do you have colorism? They absolutely exist, um, and uh, it has a social and historical basis as well that needs to be understood, for sure. Well, we've reached a uh, uh, near ending time. So first of all, I want to thank all our panelists for joining us today. I want to thank the audience for joining us today and contributing in the chat. Um, if you're interested in this work and want to learn more, um, you can join our Beauty Inside Out working group. It meets every third Wednesday of the month on Zoom. Um, like I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the panel, we're also conducting um, surveys of uh, youth aged 13 to 17 who live in northern 
northern Manhattan or the South Bronx uh, about their use of uh, uh, skin lightening and uh, hair relaxing products as well as other cosmetics. And um, so uh, if you know, if you're one of them, if you know anyone like that, uh, please sign up for the survey. Um, you can find all that information um, at the link that hopefully one of my colleagues is going to post in the chat. Otherwise, I will send that. We will also send it out in a follow up email. And um, please look out for more Beauty Inside Out events uh, around this paper and all the other work we do. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, please look out for a follow up email um, with more resources on what we discussed today and what we're doing with the campaign. And uh, have a great Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone.